chapter 4. When he says, what shall we say then, uh, that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found, what shall we say then, takes us back to the conclusions that we've been coming up to in, back in chapter, four, uh, chapter 3 of the book of Romans. And I'd like you to just go back there so that you can realize uh, what he is going to build on. You can't build on something unless you realize what he had said. He took us through three chapters of the book of Romans to come to the conclusion of verse 23, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. He had well pointed out that all men are sinners before a holy God, and there's none of us that, that uh, are an exception to that rule. All have sinned. The all there is a reference to uh, the end of verse four, where, uh, 22 where it says there's no difference, and it's a reference to Jew and Gentile. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with reading the Bible, you can just know this, is that from the book of Genesis all the way until the book of Acts, the book before the book of Romans, God had been dealing with the nation of Israel. The book of Acts is a record of the fall of the nation of Israel spiritually from God, and when you come to the book of Romans, you find out now that God is going to turn to people of all nations, Jews and Gentiles, and that's what Gentile means, nations. He's not just, the Jews are not just his people anymore. He's turned everybody, but when he's turned everybody, it's not that we are naturally his people. When he's turned everybody, he's turned everybody because everyone's on the same level as sinners. All have sinned and come short. And rather than damning us in our sin, he's going to offer us salvation through Jesus Christ. When it says in verse 24 of chapter 3, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, tells us that God, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ on the cross, God can declare us sinners righteous. He can do it freely. He does it by his grace. Grace means undeserved, unmerited favor. You don't deserve it. You haven't earned it. But God can declare a sinner righteous, and he can do it freely by his grace through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. That is, redemption speaks about a price that was paid, and Jesus Christ on the cross paid for our sins. That's why God can declare us righteous. There's been a payment that wiped the slate clean, that took care of our sins, as we learned last week, past, present, and even future. Jesus Christ made such a perfect provision for sin that he died for all mankind, all people. He died for people of all ages. From the time of Adam until, until the very last man that will ever be born, he died for them, and, and he died for all sins that any man would ever make. He died for all men, for all time, for all sin. Such a perfect, complete payment of sin was made by Jesus Christ that God can now freely give us eternal life. So the conclusion is in verse 28, therefore we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That is, it's not you going back and keeping the Ten Commandments or whatever laws you want to make up that you think God wants you to fulfill. It's not you reaching a level where God accepts you. It's you in your sin coming to God through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, realizing that Jesus Christ paid for your sins and believing on what Jesus Christ did, that the moment you believe what Jesus Christ did for you, God the Father declares you righteous because you came through His Son. And, and, and so salvation has been concluded that we're saved, we're justified by faith without deeds of the law. Now, if you come over to Romans chapter 4, Paul's going to take us back to, to Abraham, and, and he says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found? He's going to use an Old Testament patriarch. He's going to use Abraham as an example of someone who learned the very thing that we're talking about. He learned it in a different way than us realizing and studying what Jesus Christ did. But Abraham learned that God is the one who gives life. And life is not earned, it's given by God. That it's given to us on the basis of faith, and that's when God declares us righteous. Now, Paul's going to go back and give us an illustration of Abraham. Down in verse uh, uh, 6, he says, even David. Then he's going to give us an illustration of something David learned. But when he does the illustration from Abraham, he, he's going to take us back there and show us a conclusion, something that Abraham learned. And, and when he says, Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh, certainly the Jews would claim Abraham as their father because that's what God did. God took Abram and changed his name to Abraham and made him the father of the nation of Israel. That, that the, the Jewish people came from the lineage of Abraham. But when he says, our father, you know, it's one thing for the Jews to claim him, it's another thing for Gentiles to claim him. 
But what Paul has been doing in the book of Romans so far is trying to show that both a Jew and a Gentile were all on the same level, cut off from God in our sins, but, but given the opportunity to believe on Jesus Christ and be saved, equally given that opportunity. And, and so when he talks about Abraham our father, it's not just a reference to the Jews. In fact, when we finish chapter 4, you'll realize there's a way that Abraham, and the lesson that Paul's about to show us that Abraham learned, is a lesson for all of us Gentiles. Look, look, look just a little bit ahead. Look down in verse 9. It says, Cometh this blessedness uh, then upon the circumcision only? Circumcision was the sign that God gave to Abraham concerning the, the nation of Israel that would come through him, that he would have a seed that would uh, outnumber the stars of heaven and the sand upon the sea. That circumcision was a sign of that covenant to Abraham. And, and so it's a, it's a term that represents the Jewish people, the believing remnant of Israel, primarily. It says, Cometh this blessed then upon the circumcision only, or upon the uncircumcision also? Well, if you're not part of the circumcision, you're part of the uncircumcision. If you're not part of the, the seed of Abraham, the nation of Israel, then uncircumcision is a term for Gentiles. And it, it's a term that meant something to be unclean before God. Uh, it means to be out of a covenant relationship. But the question, he says, cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also? For I say that faith was reckoned to Abraham for righteousness. How was it then reckoned? When he was circum in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. And he received the sign of circumcision, the seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised, that he might be the father of all them that believe, though they be not circumcised, that the righteousness might be imputed to them also. In other words, what he does is he's going to go back to a time where Abraham learned something about God, and when Abraham believed God, God ca ca counted Abraham righteous on the basis of faith. But he, he counted Abraham righteous on the basis of faith back when Abraham, before he was ever circumcised. So that Abraham is the father of all who believe. He represents so a Gentile who gets, circ who gets circumcised. <laughs> he represents a Gentile <laughs> who, who gets justified by God on the basis of faith only. And he represents the nation of Israel. Who, who the circumcised believing remnant believe on Jesus Christ, and they'll be counted as righteous. So he, can, he represents all who believe, whether they're Jew or Gentile. And so back up in verse 1, when he says that, he, when he says, what shall we say then that Abraham our father, it's not just a reference to the Jewish people. Abraham's the father of all believers. And, and here's what Abraham learned. What shall we say then that Abraham, back up in verse 1, Abraham our father as pertaining to the flesh hath found. For if Abraham were justified, now that word justified means to be declared righteous. Paul pointed out already that we stand before God in, in sin, that we're all sinners. We come short of the glory of God. But when we believe on Jesus Christ, God declares us righteous because our sins are placed on Christ and the righteousness of Jesus Christ is put to our account and God declares it so. So God declares the believer in Jesus Christ righteous. It says in verse 2, for if Abraham, uh, no, but for if Abraham were justified by works, he'd have whereof the glory, but not before God. You know, if you're going to talk about a great patriarch like Abraham, and certainly Abraham is a great patriarch because he did some great works back there. But, but the question here, if, great, if Abraham were justified by works, he could brag about it. But he couldn't brag before God, could he? Because Abraham, after all, is just like a sinner, just like anybody else. In fact, if you just jump back to chapter 3, when Paul was declaring that we're justified by faith, he asked the question in verse 27, where is boasting then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. In other words, if you were declared righteous before God because of your good works, you could brag. But God has excluded bragging in his presence. He got rid of that. Amen. On what basis? Of works? No. If you did works, you could brag. But he saves a person on the basis of faith so that no one can brag in his presence. Because our faith is faith in what Jesus Christ did for us. Our faith involves believing we're sinners and we can't save ourselves. Nothing to brag about there, is there? But, but our faith then is in Jesus Christ and his work on the cross in our behalf as a payment for our sin. God has excluded bragging. 
So he takes us back to Abraham, a great man uh, of the Old Testament, and said, for if Abraham were justified by works, if he was declared righteous by his works, he could brag about that. And there are some good works that Abraham could do that Abraham could brag about. But notice in that verse, but not before God. And, and the reason why is Abraham isn't justified before God on the basis of his works. It says in verse 3, for what, for what saith the scripture, uh, Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. Now that's what the scripture says. And God wrote that down way back in the book of Genesis, and I'd like you to see that. Come back to Genesis, the first book of your Bible, chapter 15. God took Abraham and separated him out from all the other nations because us Gentiles, the other nations, we all turned to worshiping idols. We didn't want to believe the truth of God anymore. We already learned from the book of Romans. We got to a point we didn't even want to retain God in our knowledge, and God gave us up. He separated Abraham out, and he's going to create out of Abraham a brand new nation that never existed. And he's going to make that nation his nation. He's going to be their God, and they're going to be his people. And then through that nation, God is going to bring salvation to us Gentiles. And, and that's why God called out Abraham and created out of him the nation of Israel. Now, he called them out back in chapter 12. We'll look there in a moment. But in chapter 15, Abraham is waiting for God to fulfill a promise, but Abraham had no children. And, you know, if there's going to be a nation that's going to come out of you, then you're going to have to have kids, and they're going to have to multiply, like God said, as the stars of heaven. Well, you're getting a little old here, and he has no children, until chapter 15, verse 1 says, After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abram in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abram, which later his name gets expanded to Abraham. This is the same man. Fear not, Abram, for, uh, for I, I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. And Abram said, Lord God, if thou will give me, uh, what will thou give me, seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus. And Abraham said, Behold, to me there he, thou hast given no seed, and lo, one born in my house is mine heir. Now they had a, a custom, I believe it will be followed up in the law, that if someone is born in your house, your servant as a child, that's yours. It's just a possession of, of uh, slavery. And so Abraham saying, Lord, I, I go childless, but Eliezer, my number one steward, the one in charge of all, all my, my possessions and servants. He had a child that makes him my heir. In other words, okay, Lord, is this, is this the seed you promised me? Because I have no children. And then it says in verse 4, in, uh, it says, And behold, the word of the Lord came unto him, saying, This shall not be thine heir. But he that shall come forth out of thine own bowels shall be thine heir. And he brought him forth abroad, and he said, Look now toward the heaven, and tell the stars if thou art able to number them. And he said, said unto him, So shall thy seed be. And he believed in the Lord, and he, that is the Lord, counted it to him for righteousness. Now notice verse 6 just tells us what took place back there. God didn't say to Abraham, Well, since you believe me, I count you righteous. That's just written in there by Moses who wrote the book of Genesis, led by the Holy Spirit, to say that when Abraham believed God, God counted Abraham righteous, just on the basis of faith. And, and, and Abraham became, becomes an illustration that the Apostle Paul is using. What did Abraham do? He didn't do anything. He just believed God. In his case, Abraham believed what God said, even though he had no child, God said he's going to number his children, his seed is going to multiply like the stars of heaven, and Abraham said, well, God, if you said so, then it's true. And when Abraham believed God, God said, God, in his own determination, determined Abraham was righteous. Not on the basis of any works, just on believing God. Now, what we're to believe God about is what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. That's what Romans chapter 3 is about. That we have redemption through his blood, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ that the Lord Jesus Christ paid for our sins when he died on the cross, God said so. That is the payment of our sins. And if we'll believe that, God will count us righteous. But if we don't believe that, you're going to find out he won't count you righteous. Now, Abraham is an example of that because what else could Abraham do? Could he cause himself to have a child? Well, he was working hard at it, but nothing was happening. See, the illustration is it's God who gives life. And, uh, and, and, and not only that, just to make sure you understand this, go back to chapter 12. Let me point out just a couple verses here. Look at verse 4. This is when Abram first got to the land. It says, So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, 
and Lot went with him, and Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. So he came to the promised land, he's seventy-five years old, and he's dwelling in that land, and he's waiting for God to fulfill the promise of start multiplying his seed. Come over to chapter 16. We just got done with chapter 15. Abraham's been there a while. Chapter 16, verse 3, it says, And Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her, her maid, an Egyptian, after Abram dwelt, in the, uh, dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan, and gave her to her husband uh, to be his wife. Well, these people thought they could help God out. <laughs> And since, his, since Abraham can't have any children with his wife, and the, and the seed has to come out of Abraham's bowels, then the wife gets the idea, here, marry my handmaiden and have a child with her. So Abraham gets convinced to do that, but God said, no, that's not the child either. The child's going to be between you and Sarai, your wife. Later her name's Sarah. And so, uh, so, so what they're trying to do in helping God out, God keeps excluding it. Nope, nope, it's not, it's not going to be of you. He's now 85 years old. Then we come to where he gives them the sign of circumcision to, to prove that he is going to have a child. Chapter 17, verse 1. It says, And, and when Abram was 90 years old and nine, <laughs> the Lord appeared unto Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. 99 years old. No wonder God says, I'm the Almighty God. That's what it's going to take for a 99-year-old man to have a child now especially when you find out his wife's 89 years old. And, uh, and it's going to be him and his wife and no one else that's going to bring this child about. So God reminds him that he is the Almighty God. He can bring about what he promised. So you come over to chapter 21, and the child is born the next year. <laughs> Genesis chapter 21 in verse 5, it says, And Abram was, Abraham now, was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. Sarah is now 90 years old. At age 100, God fulfilled his promise. You know, his promise is, is that your seed is going to multiply. Well, you've got to have at least one before you can become two and four and 16 and, uh, and start multiplying, right? So he's waiting all this time, and finally at age 100, God fulfills his promise. And, and, and what God is demonstrating to Abraham is, I'm the one who gives life. I'm the one who makes promises and fulfills promises. Abraham, it's not your works. You're going to have to depend on me. And Abraham never did doubt God. He went, he did, he went about some things the way that God didn't want him to do it, but he believed what God said was going to be true. And when he believed what God said, God counted him righteous. And when we talk about giving life, receiving the gift of everlasting life. We need to realize that that's why the Apostle Paul is using Abraham as an example about how you and I can be declared righteous before God. Because, see, if we're declared righteous before God, we receive the gift of everlasting life. We'll have no sins against us. We'll dwell with God forever. We'll be a part of his life. But that being a part of God's life is not something you can do. And you need to learn the lesson that Abraham learned, that life is only something that God can give. And he gives it to those who believe. And when you believe, God counts you for righteous. And, and so Paul points out Abraham as one who learned that lesson so that both Jew and Gentile would learn that that's the way to be saved before God. That's how to be counted righteous before God. Just believe what God said. And for you and I, it's to believe what God said about Jesus Christ going to a cross, being the full satisfying payment of our sin, being a propitiation of our sin, being the redemption of our sin. It's to look to Jesus Christ as being that payment, believing God, and when we believe God, God counts us righteous and gives us everlasting life. Amen. Now, go back to Romans chapter 4. Now, in that verse 2, for if Abraham were justified by works, he'd have whereof the glory, but not before God. That, there's a little opening there for us to study something that we'll study by the way, two weeks from today. Uh, I'm not sure we'll get into it next week. Uh, next week I want to have communion, so those who are... But when we get back into our study of the book of Romans, we're going to realize that back there in verse 2, there, there's something for us to learn uh, about Abraham doing some works that were justified in the sight of men, but not before God. But uh, we'll pick up on that later, because I want to continue with this, the illustration that Paul is using. Down in verse 4, he points out Abraham and how Abraham believed God and it was counted to righteous for him for righteousness, the end of verse 3. Verse 4 says, Now 
To him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Now, when we study, when we go back up into verse 2 next time, we're going to see how important it is for you to realize that verse 4 starts out with the word now. In other words, what Paul's about to say is something that's true now. We've already realized that God has, will justify the Gentile through faith, but he was justifying the Jews by faith prior to this age that we're living in today. Back when the Jews were his people, they were given some things that they had to do. And, and, and by their faith they did it, and on the basis of their faith God declared them righteous. But what he is telling us in the age of grace is that we're saved through faith. And what he means by that is the means by which we get our salvation is nothing other than just believing. And to make that point, he says, now, and here's the truth now, to him that worketh is the reward not, uh, is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. Now you need to think of that. He, he is making a point, not only are you justified by faith, he says, to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. When he says now, he's saying now in light of the fact that we live in what's called the dispensation of the grace of God. Now that's a big word, dispensation. I heard someone use it on the, on the TV the other day as a right to eat a corned beef sandwich. They said they got a special dispensation, they can eat corned beef sandwich when they're not supposed to eat meat on a Friday or something. But that's, dispensation doesn't mean a legal right to sin. And even though eating corned beef's not sin in the first place, so you didn't need that kind of dispensation, but... The point is, a dispensation means a dispensing. And God today is dispensing to all people of all nations His grace. Undeserved, unmerited favor. That's what God is doing. And God is putting on display before everyone's eyes His grace. In fact, we who get saved by His grace are going to be placed in heaven as, uh, as a trophy, as a, as a show of the riches of His kindness in His grace toward us. So he's saving us by his grace to display how gracious he can be. You know what destroys God's grace? Man's works. Because grace is undeserved, unmerited favor. You want to get rid of undeserved, unmerited favor? Work for something. And brag that you earn it and you deserve it. Because that's the way to eliminate grace. Remember our verse in Romans chapter 11? Look at this, Romans 11:6. If you haven't seen this, we use it quite often around here, but just because it makes such a clear point, you can't be playing around with grace and works. Romans chapter 11, verse 6 says, And if by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If you add work to grace, you eliminate grace. Just erase grace and say it's works. Then on the other hand, it says, But if it be of works then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. Either you're going to get it on the basis of grace, or you're going to get it on the basis of work. If you add work, you erase grace. If you erase work, you got grace. Right? I hope I said that right. It sure sounded confusing to me. <laughs> I always say things backwards. So. <laughs> but, but it's got to be one or the other. You cannot, if you add any work to grace, you erase grace, and it becomes a basis of works. Now look again at Romans chapter 4 and realize the, the, the gravity of what Paul is saying in verse 4. If God today is offering things in his grace, and we already read in chapter 3, verse 24, being justified freely by his grace. If God's offering it to us today on the basis of grace, it says, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. If you're going to try to work off your sins, you've erased grace, and now you're left to work off all of your sins, and you know what you got before God? You don't got righteousness on your bank account in heaven. You got a debt. And you're going to be paying it for all eternity in a lake of fire because that's where sin is going to be paid for if you don't allow Jesus Christ to be your payment for sin. Someone who believes in Jesus Christ and trusts God's grace to save them, they'll receive God's grace and receive the gift of eternal life. But if they say, oh, no, I, I like what Jesus Christ did, and all that's nice and fine, but uh, i got a few things I've done, too. And you want to add your grace, soon, or your work. As soon as you add works, you erase grace, and God says, okay, you pay for it. You don't want my son to be your payment for sin? You pay for it. Now, that's a dangerous place to be, to stand before God in debt, the debt of your sin put to your account. 
and, and anyone who puts works there, adds their works, God said that's what they got. Contrast that is verse 5. Verse 5 says, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly. Now that's what God said he would do. He would declare sinners righteous, didn't he? On the basis of faith. So, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, realize what verse 5 is saying. It's saying the way to be counted righteous before God is to stop your works. You don't stop your works, you've got a debt. But if you'll not work at all, say, I'm not offering God anything, I'm just trusting in what Jesus Christ did for me, then God will declare the ungodly person, that's you, he'll declare you righteous. Because Jesus Christ paid for your sins, and when you believe the righteousness of Jesus Christ is put to your account, and God declares you righteous. It's a gift from God. But the only ones who are ever going to get this gift are those who will just stop trying to offer God their works. And, and otherwise, you, you've got this conflict of grace and works, and they don't mix. The only way to be saved is to stop your works and to trust what God has done. And when you just believe what Jesus Christ did and what God said Jesus Christ did, then God will declare you righteous. Now, you know, this is the hardest thing for religious people to get through to their mind. I mean, when you're, you know, there's a lot of people who are just evil and sinful, and if they find out there's a way that their sins can be forgiven, uh, a lot of them will just trust Jesus Christ as their Savior. But religious people who all their life are trying to, uh, you know, go to church every Sunday and keep clean and do the right thing so that they could be found before God with their righteousness, for them to realize at this point that they can't count on any of that to save them, that, that those things will actually send them to hell. They, they have a hard time getting that in their mind. But let me tell you, what are you trusting? Let me ask you, what are you trusting? Are you willing to give up trusting all your religious goodnesses, all the law-keeping that you've ever done, realizing that no matter how much you have done, you haven't done enough, and if you're going to trust in your works, you're going to have a debt before God? Are you willing to stop offering God your works and then look to Jesus Christ and see that as your payment for sin because God said so and believe what God said, that if you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, he'll give you as a gift everlasting life? Are you willing to give up your works that bring you a debt for a free gift from God through Jesus Christ on the basis of faith. You need to make that decision. And if you didn't realize, if you were mixing the two before, you probably thought you were okay trying to do both things at the same time. A little bit of works, a little bit of trusting. But you didn't realize you've lost it all because you added works to it. You've got to, he that worketh not, you've got to stop your works and believe on him that justifieth the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. Now, we're talking about works in order to be found righteous before God. The, the Bible, and, and it's not hard to understand, he's not telling you to go out and live in sin. He's just telling you don't offer your religious works to God as a, as a means of righteousness and acceptance with God. After you get saved, this Bible will tell you there's a lot of good works you ought to do. But you don't do them to get saved, you do them because you are saved. And the only way you get saved is stop doing the good works or stop offering those good works to God and believe what Jesus Christ did. Now, the next illustration he's about to give us is the most exciting thing in your Bible almost. I don't know how you compare other things in the Bible. But, you know, verse 5, who is it that God declares righteous? Go ahead and say it so I know you're with me. Okay, those who don't work, but there's another phrase in there that I want you to get. No? Okay, you're right about that? I'm glad I asked the question. <laughs> there's something in there. Who does he declare righteous? The ungodly. He says, but, he, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. An ungodly man's faith, God will count for righteousness. Now, he's about to give us an illustration. Look at verse 4, <laughs> or verse uh, 6, I mean. Even as David. Now, now he, after talking about an ungodly man being declared righteous by faith, he says, here's an illustration, David. Well, you know, people look back in the Old Testament, David is called a man after God's own heart. He replaced Saul as king of Israel because he, his heart was to do the things of God. And so you don't think of David as an ungodly man. But let me tell you, if anyone need, should have gone to hell, it should have been David. And David knew that better than you and me knows it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, what's wrong with me? Uh, 
<laughs> it came out anyhow. Uh, let, let me show you what I mean. Verse 6. Even as David also described the, bless, describeth the blessedness of the man to whom God imputeth righteousness without works. Now, David never said it that way. Verse 17, 7 is going to say, save. We're going to get David's statement. But Paul's assessment of David's life is that David understood the blessedness uh, of a man that God would impute righteousness without works. Because what, when you study the life of David, you're going to see some works that David did that if he would offer that before God, the guy's going to hell. But apart from David's work, God is going to declare David righteous. And, and David's going to learn, now the phrase here is the blessedness of that. Notice how it says, how David, he quotes David saying it this way in verse 7, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man in who, uh, to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now he's emphasizing the word blessed because David learned a blessed truth, a glorious truth. Uh, blessed means prosperous, but you know, not financial prosperity. This is him, David, before God, that there's a blessedness in knowing that God will impute to him righteousness without works. But David sees it, he didn't quite learn it in, in the vernacular of the Apostle Paul. Apostle Paul explained to us how God can declare us righteous on the basis of faith apart from works. But David learned it in this way. He, David said, blessed is the man whose iniquities are forgiven. Can you imagine to, be, to stand before a, a holy God and know that your sins are forgiven? That is a blessedness. Especially when you realize you don't deserve it. David understood the blessedness of the man in whom God, his iniquities are forgiven, whose sins are covered. As if God doesn't see the sins. They're just covered up and God doesn't see it. And you stand before God and not only are your sins forgiven, he doesn't see your sins. That's a blessedness that David learned about. Blessed is the man, the last one, in whom God will not impute sin. That is, Someone says, hey God, didn't you see what David did? God says, I didn't see it, and I won't put it to his account. No matter what someone has said or, or done, God will not impute sin. He refuses to do it. Man, that's a blessedness, isn't it? Well, that's what Paul's saying that we have through being justified by faith, that same blessedness. And perhaps you'll appreciate it if you look back and see why David appreciated it so much. Go back with me to 2 uh, Second Samuel. Chapter 11. I'm going to have to do this a little bit quickly so you follow along and you can read all the details and get all the blessedness out of it when you read every detail of it later on your own. 2 Samuel chapter 11. Here's why David was so amazed, so relieved, so blessed. 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 1, it says, And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servant with him and all Israel, and they destroyed the children of, the, of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. And it came to pass in, uh, in, in an evening tide that David arose from off, off his bed and walked upon the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman washing herself, and the woman was very beautiful to look upon. And David sent and inquired after the woman, and said, "Is not?" Uh, uh, and one said, "Is not this Bathsheba, uh, the daughter of Elam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite?" Now, by the way, there's some things here that you need to pay attention to. At a time when kings go to war, David decided to stay home. When you got too much time on your hands, you get yourself in trouble. The king's palace is certainly higher than any person's roof, right? And the roof was a place where they went to privacy to bathe, but the king having a higher palace to walk along, he's walking up there, he can look down on the rooftops of the houses, and he sees a beautiful woman, but he don't just see a beautiful woman bathing, she was beautiful to look upon. He kept looking. The Bible warns about looking upon a woman to lust after her. Then he goes one step further. The Bible says, don't make any provision for the flesh to lust after the flesh. He goes and says, who is that woman? They tell him exactly who she is and where she lives. And then 
out of the lust of his heart, verse 4 says, and David sent messengers and took her, and she came, uh, 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 and she came in unto him, and he laid with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness, and she returned unto her house. He had an affair with a married woman and sent her home, thinking everything is covered up, no one saw anything. He fulfilled the lust of his flesh. Verse 5 says, And the woman conceived and sent and told David and said, I am with child. And David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. See, her husband was out to war. And David slept with her and got her pregnant. And she says, I'm pregnant. And David says, "Uh Uh-oh, hey, send Uriah back home. I need a report from him. And what David is about to do is to try to cover up his sin because he's in trouble now. He's got another man's wife pregnant, and, and he's the king of Israel. And so he calls for Uriah, and when you read down through the chapter, what he intends to do is he tells Uriah, give me a report, how's the battle? Okay, go home to your wife, I'll talk to you tomorrow. Thinking he's going to, man, come home from war, he's going to go home and sleep with his wife. Uriah is so caught up with the, the principle of fighting with his comrades that he will not take a luxurious time, a vacation time, to go home to his wife. He sleeps right there at the palace floor, doesn't go home. David hears about that, he gets all mad, he invites Uriah back in, he gets him drunk. got to cover your sins, you know. So he gets Uriah drunk, thinking now that he's drunk, his principles will break down, he'll go home to his wife. But he doesn't do it, he stays at the palace again. So David can't get this man to go home and sleep to, with his wife to cover up the adultery that he did. And look down in verse 14, chapter 11, verse 14. It says, And it came to pass in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it uh, by the hand of Uriah. And he wrote in the letter saying, Send Uriah in the forefront of a hottest battle and retire ye from him that he may be smitten and die. Well, we'll have to take care of this another way, won't we? Take Uriah, put him... He's not the front line man. He's not that kind of a, a, a soldier. But put him in the front line and when you do, retreat, but don't tell him about it. And there's no doubt he'll die. And that's exactly what happens. He dies. His wife goes through a mourning period, and when she's done mourning, David calls her in verse 27. It says, And when the mourning was past, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife and bare a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. You know, you, you can do all kinds of cover-up that you think you can get away with. God sees everything you've ever done. You can't cover your sins before a holy God. And, and not only is a holy God, there's servants there to know exactly what went on. David, who's he kidding? He's not even kidding the people that are close to him. But he's trying to cover his sins. Now he's got laid to his account adultery and murder. I mean, he, just about, he might as well just put the sword right through Uriah himself, shouldn't he? So, so David, you know, so, there's some days you wish you would have never got up that day. And you look back and you wish you could go back one month and get rid of all those sins. We've all done that, right? You've all done something that you're so ashamed of that if, if you could go in a time machine and redo it, it would be a greatest relief of your mind. But you can't do it. And your sin's there, and your sin's is open before a holy God. Now God is displeased. Look at chapter 12. It says, And the Lord sent Nathan, he's a prophet, unto David, and, it came, and he came unto him and said unto him, uh, There were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. Hopefully you're going to catch on to this illustration. David's rich, and, the, uh, and Uriah was a poor man. It, by the way, David used to be a sheep herder before he became a king, so he, he knows what it's like to take care of sheep. Keep that in mind. It says, the rich man had exceeding many flocks and herds. You know, David had 300-something wives. He needed one more. Well, keep that in mind. Verse 3, it says, the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he brought and nourished up, and, uh, and it grew together with him and with his children, and did eat of his, his own meat, and drank of his own cup, and laid in his bosom, and was unto him as a daughter. And there came a traveler unto the rich man, and he spared, not, he spared to take of his own flock, and of his own herd, to dress for the wayfaring man that, that was come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb, and dressed it for the man that, was, that came to him. And David's anger was, kindled, uh, was greatly kin, uh, kindled against the man. And he, and, he, and he said to Nathan, As the Lord liveth, the man that hath done this thing shall surely die. 
and he and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did because he did the, this thing and because he had no pity. And Nathan said unto David, Thou art the man. David, who has a heart after God's own heart, says, The man who did this shall surely be put to death. That's God's attitude towards sin. Someone's going to pay. And, and, and David pronounced judgment, this man shall surely be put to death. And Nathan looked at him and said, you're the man. And the whole picture <laughs> is right there in David's mind, realizing that God had seen it all and, and what God thinks of it all. Look down in verse uh, um, 13. It says, And David said unto Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said unto David, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Howbeit, because this deed that thou, uh, by this deed that thou hast, thou hast given great occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme, the children also, uh, the child also that is born unto thee shall surely die. Well, you know, there's a consequence for David's sin, and it looks like a supernatural consequence here. And there, I don't believe God's supernaturally causing any consequences in your life, but I'll tell you this, the Bible says, Be not deceived, God is not mocked, whatsoever a man soweth, that will he also reap. You know, you'll reap the consequences of your sins, and David's going to do that, but you know what David was told? God has put away your sin. Wait a minute. That's a cover-up, isn't it? We, we, God's just going to cover up sin? Going to hold one person liable for their sin? Cover up another person's sin? David is a man who believes God. And God didn't just cover up sin. He might have covered it for a time, but we already learned in Romans chapter 3 that Jesus Christ's death was taking care of a forbearance of God, wasn't it? God put off the payment of David's sin till a future day, and when God's Son came into this world and died on a cross, the Bible said God laid on him the iniquity of us all. That sin was paid for. Jesus Christ went to the cross some years later and took care of David's sin. God just forbear the judgment until Jesus Christ came and made a payment for it. And not only that, God is going to take David and declare this man righteous on the basis of his faith. He will not impute iniquity to David. He refuses to do it. He put it to the account of Jesus Christ instead. His sins are covered. God never sees David's sins. And David said, blessed is the man whose sins are forgiven. Do you realize that he realizes now he's not going to be damned and go to hell, that he can stand before a holy God and be accepted because God will not impute iniquity to him, will not see his sin, has forgiven him all of his sins? He doesn't deserve that. He's an ungodly man who believes in God, who justifies the ungodly, and God counts David righteous. Now that's blessedness. And the same things that you wish you could get in that time capsule and go back and erase in your life and can't do it, you can realize the blessedness of the forgiveness of sins that's in Jesus Christ, that God will not see it, and that God will not lay it to your charge. And if you believe on Jesus Christ, all your sins are forgiven as well, and you have everlasting life Amen. eternally before God because of the payment Jesus Christ made. One last verse. Look at Acts chapter 13. This is the first message Paul preached, recorded in our Bible of what he said. Acts chapter 13. Now you don't deserve it. It's a gift of God, but don't ever forget it's through the redemption that's in Christ Jesus. He became the propitiation for sins. Acts 13, 38 says, Be it known unto you therefore, men and brethren, that through this man, speaking about Jesus Christ, through this man is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him by the Lord Jesus Christ, because of his death, burial, and resurrection on the cross that's already been completed by the time you're reading Acts chapter 13, and by him all that believe are justified from all things from which he could not be justified by the law of Moses. Amen. You know, David under the law of Moses would have to be killed for adultery and killed again for murder. Second death, <coughs> eternal damnation. But through Jesus Christ, there's forgiveness of sins, and all who believe can be justified from all things by which it could not be justified by the law of Moses. Not through works that we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. And if you'll stop offering God your works and believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ, God won't put debt to you. He'll put grace to your account. He'll impute righteousness to your account. He'll give you the gift of everlasting life. That God...
or promise from him. You need to do just what Abraham do, did, believe God. And when you do, it'll be counted for righteousness. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for displaying to us in this, this Holy Bible what it means to have the blessedness of our sins forgiven, sins so covered that they're actually gone, completely paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ, and that no matter what we've done or even will do in the future, you will not impute sin to our account. 